Um, so Nick mentioned this, but ADID is a research and innovation lab. We're basically all about the business and making uh, development finance more transparent and accountable. And uh, we've been on this sort of long, winding journey over the last 10 years, and along the way, we've learned quite a bit. So today, I'd like to just sort of share a few lessons uh, that we've learned and explain uh, why I think these lessons are relevant to the, the ongoing debate about the, the data revolution. So in light of the fact that aid data is uh, engaged in these efforts to make aid more effective through better use of data, you know, many of you may expect me to kind of make the case that the data revolution is going to deliver a wide range of uh, development benefits. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, instead, what I want to do is talk about how we can parlay the data revolution into an accountability revolution. And I think this is something that uh, Nick alluded to. Um, don't get me wrong. I'm a big believer that information liberation is a basic precondition for a data revolution. But our work at Data over the last decade has convinced me that ultimately, ultimately, we really need to be engaged on several different fronts in order to make sure that data makes a difference. Um, after all, if data isn't used, it isn't very useful. Um, to illustrate this point, I just want to share a short story. So Sarah Rock, uh, who's uh, here on your left, um, she's one of our Aid Data Summer Fellows who's been involved in uh, our in-country partnership work to expand data literacy among think tanks, civil society organizations, um, and uh, universities. And she spent the summer of 2013 embedded with a small team of researchers at uh, Kathmandu University who are studying aid effectiveness and building a Master's of Development Studies curriculum that leverages high-resolution geospatial uh, development data. And when Sarah completed her assignment and uh, returned to the U.S. at the end of the summer, this is what she told me. As we traveled through the villages, we saw the results of well-intentioned but poorly designed projects. We saw recently built schools with no teachers standing empty. We saw hospitals with no staff. We understood the value of designing truly sustainable development projects. So I'm sure many of you have heard very similar stories from other parts of the world. But what struck me about this particular story was what happened next. As Sarah's counterparts at Kathmandu University gained greater confidence in their own ability to put, to put georeference data to good use, they became interested in serving as a sort of convener of local groups um, in order to leverage geospatial development data for better analysis, advocacy, and decision making. And earlier this month, uh, Sarah's colleagues hosted the first meeting of an open data working group in Nepal, and they're now working with civil society groups to act as infomediaries uh, in Nepal who make data useful to uh, citizens in that country. So those of us who produce, publish, or use development data faced a whole host of vexing questions, right? Among them are, how can we uh, make sure that development data is actually in, uh, sort of leading to smarter policy and programming decisions? How can we detect at an early stage um, if local communities are benefiting or not benefiting from development projects? And you know, this sort of age-old question of what does it really take for a government or a donor to be accountable? So ultimately, uh, we have more questions than answers. Um, but there are some things that we do know. Uh, we can all agree that if funders and service providers want to be accountable to those whom they serve, one essential ingredient has to be information. So you can see data on the left side of this, uh, this uh, equation. Um, without information, you effectively short circuit feedback loops between suppliers of funding, service providers, uh, frontline service providers, and intended customers or beneficiaries. How, how are citizens supposed to uh, hold a government accountable or a donor accountable if they can't even see what it's doing, with whom, and where? So at a fundamental level, people need easy access to transparent information in a form that makes sense to them. And this information needs to be timely and relevant in order for it to be actionable. So I'll admit, uh, it, it's quite tempting to sort of jump on the bandwagon and embrace the call for a, a data revolution uncritically. I do, after all, live in Colonial Williamsburg, a former seat of British colonial power, which is home to more than a few revolutionaries. Um, but I think we, we really need to come to grips with 
uh, the fact that this term data revolution belies the importance of all the other ingredients that need to be on the left-hand side of this equation in order for citizens to hold governments and donors to account. There are many ways in which the data revolution has the potential to bring about an accountability revolution, but we really should not harbor any illusions that data on its own is going to solve many problems. If data is going to help produce accountability, a few other things must be true. First, there must be a robust community of data users who believe this information will help them advance their goals. Second, these users must be able to make sense of the vast stores of data now available at the click of a mouse. Third, there must be political commitment on the part of donors and governments to make course corrections on the basis of these data and the feedback that they receive from local stakeholders uh, in the communities that they seek to support. If we take these ingredients for granted, or, or other ingredients, we risk launching a data revolution that produces a great, deal of information, a great deal of information and very little accountability. Liberating the data needs to be seen as the departure point, not the destination, even if getting these other ingredients right might seem to be a daunting task. So Aid Data is experimenting with new ways to address each of these critical ingredients so that the data we collect and publish have a better chance of actually improving aid and public expenditure. And I suspect some of your organizations are doing the same. Um, so the question I'd like to address is sort of, sort of how we can transform all of our disparate efforts into a concerted response. And I'd like to try out a few ideas with you this morning. If data is going to be useful to and used by citizens, governments, and donors, I would submit to you that it needs to be hyper-local. Aid Data has devoted a huge amount of effort to mapping the precise latitude and longitude coordinates of development projects all around the world. And this makes it possible to answer the question, who is spending what, where, and to what effect? Many of you are probably aware of uh, Aid Data's partnership with the World Bank, the Mapping for Results Initiative, or perhaps the Map Africa partnership between Aid Data and the African Development Bank. Essentially, we're betting big on geospatial because we've seen firsthand that citizens, donors, public officials, civil society organizations, and journalists can use hyper-local georeference data to zero in on the communities and the challenges that interest them most. So instead of wading through spreadsheets and long-form documents, users of spatial data and technologies can easily and quickly uh, visualize and analyze what is going on, where they're working, where they're living, and investing. It doesn't take much time or effort to convince decision makers of the value proposition of subnationally geocoded data. As you can see by reading the quote from Malawi's Minister of fin Finance here on the screen. But sadly, a huge number of donors still do not publish detailed information about development projects at the local level, this sort of hyper-local data that I'm uh, calling your attention to. I'd also um, submit to you that we need to think creatively about new ways of making development data meaningful for those who want to use it. Uh, when citizens and officials are inundated with information, it's hard to hold anyone accountable. We need to do a much better job of identifying and equipping infomediaries who can help others make meaning of vast stores of data and then package this information in an easily understandable way. There are some exciting examples out there, uh, some of which you may be aware of. The World Bank holds these data journalism boot camps. US government hosts tech camps to foster data literacy. I know there's a new effort underway to build an open development toolkit uh, by the Open Knowledge Foundation and development initiatives. I think that looks really promising. Um, Aid Data itself is embedding uh, fellows like Sarah Rock, who I just introduced you to, within uh, government ministries within donor agencies and civil society groups to provide hands-on training so that local stakeholders can more effectively use development data. Uh, but as a community of practice, we are really only just scratching the surface. There's a huge amount of work that needs to be done to build robust and sustainable communities of development data users. In the grand scheme of things, I would argue that all of this is relatively easy compared to the task of creating mechanisms and incentives for funders and service providers to collect and act upon local citizen feedback. Um, 
In the coming weeks, we will be rolling out major functionality uh, upgrades to adata.org that focus on collecting user input and closing the feedback loop between donors, governments, and their intended beneficiaries. You'll now be able to comment on uh, projects, upload documents, videos, and photographs, and challenge the accuracy of individual data points in this, in this web portal. We want to collect the best information that the crowd has to offer and then deliver it to decision makers in a digestible way. Here's one example of a project page uh, from our public database. Uh, sorry, that's uh, actually data literacy. Got a bit behind. Here's, a, here's the project page uh, from our public database. And uh, shortly after uh, we uh, launched this, this uh, database, someone submitted a photo. Um, we did not know if this particular Chinese aid project in Uganda was ever completed. Someone from the crowd uh, in Uganda submitted a photograph confirming that this, uh, this technological demonstration center was, in fact, uh, completed. So building crowdsourcing technologies is one thing, as we's, we've, we've already done, but getting people to use them, particularly in non-emergency settings, is quite another. And to begin to crack this nut, we have a number of experimental evaluations in the pipeline. The focus of these evaluations is to test when citizens, journalists, MPs, and civil society groups are willing to provide feedback on the status and the performance of development projects. We also want to understand the conditions under which governments and donors actually respond to this feedback. So is a sustainable crowdsourcing platform that provides real-time information about development projects possible? I certainly hope so, uh, but it will take many people experimenting and building, experimenting with and building a body of knowledge about what works and what doesn't work. We need to get ready to pilot, to test, and to fine-tune new crowdsourcing methods and mechanisms. We need to document lessons learned regarding how best to provide uh, a supporting ecosystem for feedback to be shared and acted upon. And we need to keep in mind usability, accessibility, and human capability before attempting to go to scale. I uh, hope we can work together to put data to better use for the communities we serve. And thanks so much for the opportunity to speak this morning.